News tonight on the Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of the Voice of America, your source for Pan African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight, South Africans that that won. That's uh, singer Nomsebo Zikode, who's actually probably best known for her song or the song she sang on Jerusalem. That's host and producer of VOA's Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell, talking about the winner of the best global performance in last night's Grammy Award ceremony. Details coming up. Also, scores of Sudanese protested in the capital today against plans for diplomatic relations with Israel. The Global Water Partnership says the climate crisis is a water crisis. And Mali's military has ordered the rights chief with the UN peacekeeping mission to leave the country. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. But first, our top story. Scores of Sudanese protested in the capital today against diplomatic relations with Israel after last week's surprise visit by the Israeli foreign minister. Michael Latith reports from Khartoum, Sudan. Dozens of Sudanese protesters chant no normalization with Israel as they hold banners saying Sudanese military leader Abdul Fattah al-Burhan committed a betrayal. Monday's protest comes days after Sudanese and Israeli officials announced that the two countries are moving toward normalizing ties. The announcement was made Thursday after an official visit by the Israeli Foreign Affairs Minister Eli Cohen, who met with Sudanese officials in Khartoum. Speaking to VOA during Monday's protest, Muhammad Asafi said he rejects any form of normalization with Israel. Al-Safi, who is a member of the self-described popular campaign against normalization with Israel, says Al-Burhan's decision does not reflect the will of the Sudanese people. He says, we are at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to raise our voice that Khartoum shall remain the town for no to peace, no to normalization and no to recognition of Israel. That policy, known as the Three Nos, was established at a 1967 Arab League summit in Khartoum soon after the 1967 Mideast War where Israel took control of Jerusalem and the West Bank. Another protester, Tamad Romer, says she took part in the protest to reject the illegality of the decision taken by the Sudanese military leaders. Speaking to VOA, while wearing a Palestinian scarf around her neck, she said, her religion does not allow her to live in peace with Israeli people. That is why the government's decision does not serve the interests of all Sudanese people. She says, as a Muslim, I reject the normalization in principle and value. And as Sudanese people, we will not sell our country to Zionists. She says, such a decision can only be the mandate of an elected and a legitimate government. Another demonstrator, Al-Fadil Abu Bashar, says protesters will push to maintain the rejection of any ties with Israel. He says this is an unconstitutional and illegal decision, and they, the military, do not have the right to take such a decision. He says we are ready to face the illegal step with all the rejection it means. All means are open for us. Abdurrahman Khalil the spokesperson of the Sudanese Foreign Affairs Ministry downplayed the protest, saying people are free to demonstrate. It is normal that uh, part of the Sudanese are against it. They have the right to get uh, to express their opinion. In 2020, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco all normalized relations with Israel as part of the U.S. brokered Abraham Accords. Sudan separately announced plans to establish diplomatic ties with Israel in a deal brokered by the administration of former U.S. President Donald Trump. In January 2021, Sudan's government issued a declaration paving the way to normalizing ties with Israel and later approved a bill abolishing a boycott of the country established in 1967. Michael Atid for VOA News, Khartoum, Sudan. 
The French news agency AFP says a Cameroonian tycoon was arrested today in connection with the slaying of radio journalist Martinez Zogo. The news service says the owner of the Lancedot Media Group, Jean-Pierre Amougou Belinga, was apprehended overnight and taken to the State Defense Secretariat. Two others were also arrested as suspects in the case, a local television journalist and Belinga's father-in-law, a retired colonel and former commander of Cameroon's Presidential Guard. Martinez Zogo, who was the manager of the privately owned Amplitude FM, regularly accused Belinga and others of corruption and frequently faced threats. Belinga, reportedly the friend of several ministers, owns a daily paper and several pro-government TV and radio stations. Zogo was abducted on January 17th outside a police station in the suburbs of Yaoundé. His mutilated body was found five days later. The government has called for a full probe into his death. Mali's military government has ordered the right chief with the UN peacekeeping mission in the country to leave by tomorrow. Annie Rasenberg reports from Bamako, Mali. Mali's military government ordered the UN peacekeeping mission's human rights chief on Sunday to leave the country within 48 hours. Guillaume Ngefa Atondonko Andali is the director of the Human Rights Division of the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, or MINUSMA. A government statement read on state TV station ORTM by presenter Ibrahim Traore and later posted to the station's Facebook page declared Andali persona non grata, or unwelcome. He says this measure follows the destabilizing and subversive actions of Mr. Andali in flagrant violation of the principles and obligations that must be observed by United Nations officials. The statement said Andali was biased in his selection of witnesses testifying at the UN Security Council. Malian activist Aminata Sheikh Diko at a January 27 Security Council meeting accused Mali's government of working with Russian military partners who committed rights abuses. The Malian government statement did not mention Diko by name, but accused Andali of selecting usurpers to speak to the council. Several countries have accused Mali of working with Russian mercenaries to fight Islamist insurgents, but the government says it only works with official Russian instructors. Several journalists and rights groups have reported on alleged abuses committed by Russia's Wagner group of mercenaries in Mali. The UN peacekeeping mission, MINUSMA, did not immediately comment on the announced expulsion and does not have a spokesperson in Mali. Mali in July expelled MINUSMA's spokesperson Olivier Salgado after he tweeted about the arrival of Ivorian troops as support for a UN contingent. Mali's military government said the 46 troops were mercenaries, detained them for seven months, and in December sentenced them to 20 years in prison for conspiring against the government. Three female troops released in September were sentenced to death in absentia. The government finally released them all in January under threat of sanctions by the economic community of West African states. Separately, Mali's Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced Sunday that Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, would be visiting Mali today and Tuesday. French troops helped Mali in 2013 after Islamists took over the north of the country, but withdrew their forces last year over concerns about Mali working with Russian mercenaries. Mali's military overthrew the government in August 2020 after popular protests over its failure to stop the insurgents. Annie Reisenberg for VOA News, Bamako, Mali. The advocacy group Human Rights Watch says the failure of Nigerian authorities to address insecurity and abuses in past elections could put the upcoming polls at risk. On February 25th, voters will choose a new president replacing Mohamedou Buhari, who is completing his second four-year term along with members of the National Assembly, governors and state lawmakers. Human Rights Watch says the government failed to prosecute those involved in abuses in elections in 2019 and 2015, including allegations against security forces, partisan thugs, and armed gangs. The group says a committee set up by the Nigerian army to investigate violence was given two weeks in 2019 to produce its findings, but to date no information has been released. 
Southern Turkey has been struck by a powerful earthquake along the Syrian border. Authorities have confirmed more than 2,000 dead and thousands more injured with a state of emergency declared. Calls are out for international assistance. Dorian Jones reports from Istanbul. A man calls out to someone buried deep in the rubble of a collapsed apartment block in the southern city of Malatya. All over southern Turkey, rescuers are in a desperate race against time to find survivors following one of the most powerful earthquakes to strike the country in decades. Videos on social media show streets of destroyed apartment blocks due to the quake, which had a magnitude of 7.8 according to preliminary readings. Collapsing buildings hampered rescue efforts as powerful aftershocks shook the region. Professor Orhan Tatar of Turkey's Disaster Response Agency, Afad, warned of the scale of the aftershocks. Tatar said there has been more than 100 aftershocks. Three of them are above 6.6. And there has just been another earthquake centred in the town of Elbistan, triggered by the initial quake. Turkish Vice President Fuat Oktay said more than 1,700 buildings had collapsed by late morning. Interior Minister Suleyman Soylu said all the country's resources are being mobilised. Soylu said all of Turkey's governors were on duty. He added the gendarmerie, police and the Turkish armed forces, disaster and emergency teams. Turkish Red Crescent and search and rescue teams from all over the country were being dispatched to the region. The earthquake struck at 4.15 a.m. local time between the cities of Karaman Marash and Gaziantep. Two state hospitals were among the buildings that collapsed Monday in southern Turkey. The strong quake surpasses the 1999 shock that hit close to Istanbul and killed more than 17,000 people. Many people in the region are on the streets in sub-zero temperatures. Severe winter conditions are hampering rescue efforts due to heavy snow in the region. Many roads have been heavily damaged and at least one runway at an airport was rendered unusable. The Turkish government declared a state of emergency and called for international assistance. The United States issued a statement saying any and all needed assistance would be provided. Ukraine, India and Israel are also offering support as Turkey mobilises what is expected to be one of the largest emergency operations in the country's history. Syrian health officials said at least 371 people were killed in the government-held areas, while rescue workers said at least 221 others died in rebel-controlled areas. Doreen Jones for VOA News, Istanbul. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Please note, we have moved our programs from voanews.com to voaafrica.com. There you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. Find us on voaafrica.com. President Joe Biden's second annual State of the Union speech uh, be a, a rerun of will it be a rerun of the first or will he cover a new ground? Analysts lay out what they expect to hear from the president in this yearly speech before a Congress that is no longer completely on his side. VOA's Anita Powell reports from Washington. Ukrainian ambassador to the United States. This is the chance for President Joe Biden to lay out his priorities before the newly sworn in Congress. Days ahead of Tuesday night's speech, White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre warned that the speech is often reworked until the very last moment. But, she said, some topics are a safe bet. The significant economic progress we're seeing under his leadership, his economic vision that's building our economy from the bottom up and middle out, the historic pieces of legislation passed into law over the last two years, uh, which are creating good, uh, paying middle class jobs and delivering real results for people by fixing our roads, bridges, tunnels, lowering costs on uh, everyday goods. But, says historian Jeremy Suri, this policy speech is also, and always, politicized. He spoke to VOA on Zoom. The politics matter for policy. So this is the opportunity the president has each year to try to set the agenda 
and to frame the public debate in ways that will benefit uh, him and his party, but also hopefully create pressures toward the policy goals that he has. Suri said he expects Biden to revisit his previous remarks on the soul of the nation and what he sees as threats to democracy from the far right. The war in Ukraine is also likely to come up, as it did a year ago, when it was in its infancy and Biden spoke of the West's need to help the nation fend off the Russian invasion. Biden has also said his administration wants new laws on abortion, gun violence, and police reform. But he faces a challenge. Congress holds the power to pass laws, and the opposition Republican Party now controls one of the two chambers. New House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who will take his seat behind the president on Tuesday, is locked in a debate with Biden over how to spend American taxpayer money. Republicans seek major cuts to government spending. I've been very clear. The current path we're on, we cannot sustain. We've got to change the directory to put ourselves on a path to balance. How we get there will be our discussions. And so he says people will be watching McCarthy's reactions as he sits behind Biden during the address. If he frowns, if he shows his displeasure, he looks dyspeptic. He looks like he's not cooperative. He looks like he's an extremist. But if he looks too happy to um, engage with President Biden, then, of course, he will alienate the far right in his party, the small group within his party and within the House, who are demanding that he take on the president. This mix of politics, policy, pomp, and personalities will be on full display when Biden speaks Tuesday night. Anita Powell, VOA News, Washington. Africa was well represented at the 2023 Grammy ceremony held yesterday in the U.S. state of Los Angeles. The ceremony was hosted by South African comedian Trevor Noha. Artists from South Africa and Nigeria were honored. For more on the matter, I talked to the host and producer of VOA's Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell. She starts out by listing the African artists nominated this year. Sure. Hi, Yeheus. It's nice to be with you. So the nominees of, were um, in the best global music performance category. That was the most, that category had the most African nominees in it. So there was the Ghanaian reggae dance hall artist Rocky Dawoni for his song called Never Bowed Down, and that featured another artist named Black Hero. There was Ugandan dance hall artist Eddie Kenzo, and he also had an American singer on that song called Matt B., and that was a Luganda and English collaboration called Gimme Love. And there was also the South African singer, Nomsebo Zikode, with also flutist Wouter Kellerman and DJ producer Zakes Bantwini for their song Bayete, Burna Boy for his song Last Last. So for global music category, there was Burna Boy again for his album Love Damini and Angelique Kijo with Ibrahim Malouf for an album called Queen of Sheba. Kijo was also up for best song written for visual media. And then Thames, the Nigerian singer, was up for three nominations, the best melodic rap performance and best rap song, and also for a performance on album of the year by Drake called Wait For You. Let's talk about the winners. Yes. So the big winner was for best global music performance. We had the South Africans that that won. That's uh, singer Nomsebo Zikode, who's actually probably best known for her song or the song she sang on Jerusalem. Remember that one, Yaheas? Anyway, so this song, they won Nomsebo, Nomsebo Zikode with uh, the flautist, Wouter Kellerman, and Zakes Bantwini. So Bayete, that song, is the best global music performance of 2020 2022. Um, and then also Thames, the Nigerian singer, she also took away an award. And um, she rose to prominence, in case some of your listeners don't know who she is, after she featured on WizKids' 2020 single called Essence. Uh, and that song is still hot on many playlists and it's it's a it's a classic now but she also took away a grammy so those are the two big winners of of this year's grammy awards yeah that makes her uh, the first female nigerian artist to win a grammy awards ah that's true yes uh, it's 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 a first for for nigeria first for her last point is this an indication uh, performers in africa are now being recognized by the uh, Western audience. 
Absolutely. It's been coming slowly, but in this past year, it maybe the past two years, it's really so uh, prominent African music, especially West African Afrobeats uh, style, that the, the Grammy uh, CEO, Harvey Mason, said just a few months ago back in Ghana that the Grammy Oversight Committee is considering adding Afrobeats as a category in the Grammy Awards. That was the host and producer of VOA's Music Time in Africa, Heather Maxwell. She talked to me from our VOA studios here in Washington. The climate crisis is a water crisis, especially for Africa, says the Global Water Partnership. It's an alliance of international organizations working to ensure the world has enough water in the future. The partnership's been an official intergovernmental observer at every United Nations climate change conference held so far. But still, it says governments are not doing nearly enough to make water security possible. Darren Taylor reports. Alex Similabwi is the executive secretary of the Global Water Partnership. The civil engineer and public policy expert developed and leads a program aimed at water security across 60 countries spanning four continents, including Africa. Less than 10% of Africa's potential in terms of hydropower is developed, particularly because we have not developed sufficient infrastructure in terms of dams that can capture the rainwater. Uh, I think with the exception of North, parts of North Africa and South Africa, which has quite a number of large dams, most sub-Saharan African countries do not have that. So when your floods come, the water ends up in the ocean. And the following year, uh, you don't have water because it's a drought. Simalabwi, a former co-chair of the World Bank Expert Group for Climate Resilience, says climate change is sparking more intense droughts and flooding across Africa. In that context, he says, the continent needs to fund small infrastructure like tanks to store rainwater, but also billions of dollars for big hydropower programs. You need that for energy production, for agriculture, so that when you have challenges in terms of drought, you have the water. We cannot be in a situation as a continent where we basically respond to the, to the changes in the rainfall cycle. We should be able to have infrastructure that should be able to help us regulate the flow of water for different economic sectors, but also for livelihoods. Simalabwi acknowledges that building large dams has the potential to harm communities, especially when governments don't respect standards set by institutions such as the African Development Bank. These standards, he says, ensure big reservoirs meet environmental and humanitarian regulations, protect livelihoods downstream and conserve nature. Simalabwi has advised more than 20 African governments on the integration of water into national economic development. He also helped formulate the African Union framework for water security. He says a lot of Africa's water crises are because of bad governance, not because of climate change. Simalabwi says even when there's not corruption, local authorities don't spend on water management. They've got funding going into agriculture for irrigation, funding going into health sector for sanitation, funding dedicated to water, and funding going to municipal governments, but it's not optimized in the way that you can be able to have impacts. The World Bank says Africa needs about $40 billion a year to help it achieve basic access to water and sanitation by 2030. Simalabwi says there's a shortfall of between 11 and $20 billion. He says that money needs to be available now to meet the 2030 target. Simalabwi says African governments must implement two strategies as soon as possible to ensure water security. Make best use of existing funding by employing people with the management skills to do so and involve the private sector. You can't believe it, but only about 70% of funding currently in Africa comes from the private sector. If you compare with energy and telecom, you're talking about 87% to 93% within Africa going to energy and ICT. Without collaboration between governments and private corporations, says Simalabwi, a water-secure Africa will remain a distant dream. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. 
And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehia Suhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Barrow, and our engineer, Cornelius Tanner. 